main trick when you're cutting up vegetables is that you start with a serrated knife. It has a little, little teeth on the edge. And that's especially important if you're cutting a tomato because that little serrated knife can go right into the skin while you hold the tomato still with your thumb. As you can see, I've got an onion here, but it, it works for, for a, a lot of vegetables. So I, the main thing I want to do is to create a flat surface. Once I do that, my onion will hold still. So to start off, I put my thumb on it and I put that serrated knife in and make a cut underneath my thumb. I'm not cutting into the thumb. I actually didn't get that one very low. I better cut a little bit lower. And now I've got a surface that's flat on the end and when I turn it like that, it's a little bit more stable. So I do the same thing at the top end and there are a couple of different ways then to go about cutting up this onion but once it's holding still for me I can pretty much just go like this and now I've got two really good flat surfaces and I can also make a cut without going through very far that allows me to just take off the outer section of the onion I'll do that again on the other half so you can see it I'll just take my knife, I'm steadying this with my thumb and I rock the knife back, cut down a little bit at this end and that allows me to take off the outer layer. So now what I have left is the onion that I really really want to chop up and use. And the easiest way to do it and still have it stay in one piece for me is to have it down flat and just cut from the end like this and sometimes it's easier if you switch to a bigger knife because with a big knife you can rock the knife back and forth and that makes everything go a lot faster so what I have now as I tip it off and get these large slices I still often like to keep those slices close to each other and then cut them down the other direction so then I can do as much chopping and fine chopping as I want to do I'll take this other section, keep my sections together, and after that I just go around in different directions and just sort of hold it together. You don't need to be holding it with your other hand really. You can just sort of use a knife to scrape the pieces so that they stay near each other and rock your knife up and down. And you can do chopping for pretty much as long as you want to do if you want to have it chopped really fine or leave it in larger pieces. So that's pretty much what you do for cutting up an onion. I'd like to show you how to slice a tomato. And um, one thing to think about is the knife that you use. If you have a plain knife that does not have a serrated edge, you might find that it's a little bit hard to get through that tomato skin. But suppose you're in someone else's kitchen and you don't have a serrated knife. You can take a regular knife and just puncture into your tomato and that makes a little place where you can get the blade and then you can go on cutting. Okay, put that down, but picking up a serrated knife, which is the better way to start, let me wheel this around and just show you. If you put your thumb on the tomato to hold it still, and you put that serrated knife in, it goes right through the skin of the tomato. With a tomato, as with any other fruit or vegetable that you're trying to cut up, what you want to do is create a flat, stable surface. So I've got a flat top. Now when I turn the tomato down, it's going to hold still for me. And the next trick is to cut slices. And again, the serrated edge really helps. Hold it steady with the thumb and get that knife in and scoot across more or less under your thumb. And you've got slices. Now they aren't going to be perfect, um, but then it doesn't matter whether your tomato slices are absolutely perfect. They do work. You just keep going down like this. So you get near the bottom, it's a little bit trickier. The tomato needs to be a little bit firm, and this one is. These are beautiful slices, actually. Nothing wrong with that. And I think I can get one more slice out of it here. And wheel it around a little bit. There we go. Now suppose we're making a salad, and we need to cut up a pepper. One good way to do it is to just cut down from the top. The pepper stands on its own pretty well. 
cutting right through the seed in the center. And I just grab the seed part and turn the pepper over and snap it out. And that flattens the pepper a little bit. I'll do the other half here. Just grab the seed portion, flip it over, snap it out. And now I have a pepper to cut up, taking a smaller knife maybe here. I'm cutting it in strips and it stays pretty still for me while I do that, but you notice there is one place where there's some inner membrane that you might like to get out of there. So after you've got it down to a pretty small slice, you can put your thumb on the tip. I wouldn't want to do it while it's as big as this, so I might cut it down close right beside the membrane. So I have a smaller strip to work with not too good an idea really. It's a little bit better when I had the membrane right in the center of the strip, but anyway, not a big deal. Just go like that, cut it into strips. If you want to chop it into smaller pieces, you just line up those strips and with a bigger knife, just go like that and make the chops. So I'll finish the cutting over here. And again, putting my thumb on the back, taking the knife up to the end, and bring it under that membrane, can cut it off. Make it into strips, and line up my strips here. Let's make this one a little smaller. Line up the strips, and then chop whatever size pieces you want for sautéing or for a salad. Okay, let's cut up a carrot. Now maybe you want to make carrot slices or maybe you want to chop up carrot pieces to saute or to put in a salad. So let's start off with the carrot slices and um, the first thing to look at is that we have a real problem trying to get a stable flat surface for this carrot. Um, this is an imperfect art but if we start by chopping off the bottom I usually cut up about an inch, kind of imagining there might be pesticides in the base there. I don't know if that's true. But when I do that, it, it's going to stand up for me. Um, I actually need to cut off the top, too. Let's go back down again. Now I've got something to start with, and I just try to take it down from the top. Sometimes I miss, and it's a good example of what can happen. <laughs> Uh, so you just try it again. Try to aim a little bit toward the center of this base and eventually you might get it or you might just end up chopping off the top. Let's see here. Try a little bit different angle. There, I got enough down that I can get my carrot to lie flat for me. And now taking a bigger knife, go like that, and I've got some carrot slices coming up. Always turning it over on the flat side because that way it holds still for me until I can cut it. Now I've got some slices and uh, that's enough if you just want carrot sticks to go in the refrigerator to hand out to children. But if you want to do a little bit more chopping for a saute or for a salad, best thing is to just line up those sticks and then chop down. A big knife gives you lots of leverage. You can just do chopping that way. I try to use plastic bags sparingly because the earth is finite and plastic is an oil-based product that is not really a renewable resource, but if I do want to put things in plastic bags, I shake it out and try to stand it more or less open and scoop what I'm putting in. And as soon as I put it in the bottom, it helps to hold the whole bag for me. That works out pretty well. Sometimes it helps if you're putting something larger in a bag to put the bag on the side and then slide the piece of cheese in or whatever you're putting in the bag. This works pretty well, and 
I don't use the little twister wires because they're more work than they're worth, but I just twist the top of the bag and set it down like that and put it in the refrigerator. Now, celery is pretty interesting. because I've discovered something, if you leave the celery hearts just as they come from the store without tearing apart the stalk, you have sort of the benefit of the other hand holding these stalks together. And if I want to cut up some small pieces for a saute, I cut off the ends so I have good fresh pieces. And then I just keep on going like this. And it's a wonderful way to cut up a lot of celery. Now, what I used to do, and you might still do it this way for small amounts, is to break off an individual stalk, and by placing it down, it's going to be stable. And you might want to cut off the very end here. And once that's trimmed off, then you take your big knife again and just go right on down the stalk like this. And you have then a smaller amount of celery. Now, just in case you were getting too confident, I'm going to show you something that uh, sometimes works, and that is how to, to peel and then slice a cucumber. There are probably a lot of methods that work, and this is just the only thing I've been able to think of that, uh, that's reliable. I start by pressing down my thumb and, as you can see, I'm bracing it against me. Um, one thing to remember is that you're not going to be terribly fast at some of these tasks compared to a person who's using two hands. But the point is to at least understand that you can do it if you want to. And if you're in the situation where you need to do it, you can pick up an ordinary potato peeler. And I'm just rotating the cucumber as I go. And as you can see, I'm not making any attempt to peel the ends. Just doing the middle here. And then I have another idea for getting to the ends. OK. Got the middle peel. And we take a knife and cut it. And once again, using our all-important principle of finding a flat surface, I've got our little cucumber standing on end, and it's often good to wear an apron or a cloth at your waist. And holding my thumb on the top, I can now peel up. And this is the way to peel that cucumber. There's another technique I've tried in the past, which is to have a cutting board that had two nails that were driven through from underneath. And those two nails could be used to impale a vegetable or a fruit while I work on it. Uh, so that's another alternative. It's a little bit of trouble to wash up a board that has two nails sticking up. You have to keep a cup on top of those nails so that you don't scrape your hand when you're working on the board doing other things. And uh, you want to make sure the nails aren't rusting and so on. So at some point, I decided I didn't feel like even taking the trouble to, to use the nail. So I didn't. There I have a perfectly beautiful cucumber. And let's go on with the next step with the cucumber for slicing. And that would be, just like with the carrot, go straight down from the top. This time, we're looking at the seeds inside. And if we want to take those seeds out, one of the ways to do it is to cut this so that you have a little peak. And right along the peak is the part of the flesh that you want to cut out. So again, putting your thumb at the end and putting your knife underneath the part. This looks a lot like the inside of the pepper membrane that we took out. Slide your knife along and then pick up the part that you want to discard. Holding the end with your thumb and sliding underneath the membrane. 
pick it up. And that works pretty well. And after we've done that, we have some cucumber slices that we can cut to whatever size for a salad. And there we have peeled and sliced and chopped cucumber. Okay, now we're going to cut up some potatoes, say for potato soup, into cubes. Um, the first thing to do is to think about washing the potatoes. And the easiest way I've found is to take a dishcloth, make sure you wrung it out, and put it right here over the sink because this dishcloth needs to absorb the water from scrubbing the potatoes. I take a scrub brush. It's a pretty rigid one. This one is a plastic one so that the bristles don't get flat and, uh, and useless. So I take the scrub brush and I hold it right against this cloth and right against my hip. And then I take a potato, run it under the water, and then scrub like this. And I just move the potato all around, getting the top and the bottom until I've made the full circle. I'll do a little bit more rinsing. I generally just use my thumbnail on the eye of the potato. It's the simplest way to do it. And after a second rinse, come back Scrub a little bit more. And now the potato is ready to be sliced. So once I've cleaned the potato, obviously if I'm just putting it in a roast or uh, boiling the potato, um, the easiest thing is to just cut it in half and uh, put it in water to boil. If I wanted to peel this potato, what I would do is boil it and take it out and while the skin is uh, soft and easy to take off, I put it in this position and hold it with my thumb and just tear up like this and pull off the skin. It's a little difficult to do because it's so hot. Um, so you might want to you know, run cool water over it just before you do that. Um, I also leave the peelings on my potatoes a lot since that's a lot easier. So if I'm cutting it up though to cube it, say for a soup, then I do a little bit more cutting and line up the pieces that are cut and then just go like this. And the potatoes small enough now to cook through in a soup. Taking the other side, put it down so that I have a flat surface that holds still. And if I want to make smaller cubes, I might make two cuts before I begin the cross cuts. And that way I can have smaller pieces. I line them all up, hold them, keep them together, and then come down. And this gives me smaller pieces. And that's the potato. Now to slice an apple, I have found the very simplest thing is just an apple slicer. You can find these just about anywhere. And you just center it on top of the apple and it's made with two sides to be pulled down with both hands. So what you probably want to do is place your hand over it and push down to get it started. And sometimes it's pretty hard to do. In fact, there are times that I've taken it like this and pushed it down with my hip and depending on the apple that you get, but usually you can just keep pushing like that, rock it a little bit and get it to go down and slice your apple. And there you are. If you want to take these, say you want to slice apples for apple pie, um, that's more time, in more time in trouble than you probably really want to spend, um, if you want to peel it, that is, for apple pie. But you can do it using uh, the method I talked about before by putting your thumb on one tip and your knife on the other. The peeling that you take off is pretty thick there and you're losing a little bit of the flesh, but you do have a slice. You have a thickish slice. And if you just give it one cut, you've got really 
a very serviceable apple slice to put in your apple pie. To slice bread, it's, uh, it's pretty difficult to get a regular loaf of bread to sit still for you, even though it has a flat bottom, because with a serrated knife, even a very good sharp knife, you need to go back and forth and you need for the loaf to um, hold still. There are different products that you can find that, that uh, hold the bread in sort of a cradle and have openings on either side where your knife can slice down through. But if you're visiting at someone's house and there is no special um, way of holding the loaf still, um, if you're lucky enough to just have an electric knife available, that's the best thing to do. What I have here is a loaf of banana bread, which really does hold still pretty well for any, any type of knife. But the um, most convenient thing is to just take an electric knife and make the slices. And once we have a slice, if you'd like to wrap it in saran wrap or tin foil, um, you can pull the saran wrap out of the box the length that you think you're going to need. And the trick then is to find a way to pull it along this edge and have the box to stay still for you. And I've found that if I just put the box like this, I can get that serrated edge to sit still for me. I might even try tilting it back this way if I can get it to stay upside down while I tear along like this to get the saran wrap off. So it's not a perfectly quick method, but it does work. And then I can place my bread here and wrap the ends over. And then I've got a piece of bread that I can store in plastic wrap. I have a clementine here. And if this were an orange, I would take my knife and cut it right down from the top and then take the flat side and put it down and cut it again and, um, and I would quarter it or really cut those quarters into eighths so that you have little triangular pieces to eat. But with a clementine, it's much easier to just go ahead and peel it and eat it. And you can tell by just putting your thumb at the top or at the bottom that it's really easy to dig in there and the peeling separates so easily from the fruit that uh, you can make a game of it and see whether you can keep it all in one piece. But it's very easy to just peel this way and there you have the peeling separate from the fruit and the little segments just pull apart really easily so if you're at someone's house and they have a big fruit bowl, uh, don't hesitate to take a clementine and start it with your thumb right on the top and it'll peel really easily for you. If you're at someone's house and there's a bowl of fruit passed around and you decided to take a banana, it's a little bit more of a delicate question. If I'm by myself and I want to eat a banana, I would just flip the top and then I would peel it with my mouth, just pull the section down. Um, but if I'm around other people, what I need to do is put the banana down flat and peel it while it's lying flat. So if you're sitting or standing somewhere and don't have a table, you might have a little bit of difficulty doing a banana. But when you do it like this and have the banana flat, you can just pull the peeling off and now you're ready to eat this banana. One thing to remember when you're working in the kitchen is that if you need to stir things, let's say you're making a tuna salad. So you've got tuna in here and mayonnaise and pickles and some other things. Uh, you want to stir all those things together. First of all, if you're using a heavy glass dish or a bowl, you have a better chance of it uh, holding still for you while you stir. Um, but the other little trick is to take your dishcloth and have it pretty wet and put it on the counter. And then when you set the bowl on top of it, this bowl is going to hold still for you while you work. 
Another possibility is that if you want to stir some things and you don't really need to use a mixer, you might think about just using your mixer bowl because the bowl is held fast right in the base and so it's going to hold still for you and you can stir whatever you want to in there and um, that will work just as well. One of the first things you have to deal with in working in your kitchen is finding a way to get into cans and jars and bottles. It's nice to have a manual can opener that works with one hand and they are hard to find but if you look you can find some of them. The thing to look for is that it has a single fixed handle rather than two pieces that have to be held together with one hand while you turn it to open the can. So if you can find one and put it on the edge of your can. I usually push it up against my side and as I turn this handle on the side it engages and clenches into the side of the can and as you can see the can is turning and the handle is being held by my side or by my hip like this and as the can rotates it's being opened all the way around and then turn it backward and that releases it and it comes off. A lot of products are sealed in plastic containers and they have a clear plastic seal that goes all the way around the top. It's hard to break that seal with your hand and it's easiest if you just take a pair of scissors and snip to start it and then when you tear all the way down you can then pull the rest of the seal off. A container like this has a plastic ring that goes all the way around and uh, is attached to the lid and that seal between the two is what needs to be broken as you're opening the lid. And there are some jar opener um, mechanisms that you can buy. Some of them can be installed underneath your counter, um, underneath your cabinet, above the counter. And those are, are really important to have. And you can then put a jar underneath your cabinet and turn it to open it. But supposing you're camping or you're at someone else's house, uh, you've gone out for a picnic and you've bought a jar of apple juice and you want to open it, it might be nice to think of another way that you could do that. And one possibility is sometimes to place the object between your feet and hold it and turn. And you can open it that way. Voila! To grate cheese you can always use a food processor. The problem is that it's often a mess to get the thing out and to clean it up afterward, especially if you're just grating a small amount of cheese. So I usually take a cheese grater like this. And again, if you're at someone's house, they don't have a food processor. Um, you, you're living somewhere temporarily. Uh, in an apartment or a vacation home or something, you might find that it's much more likely that there will be a, a little grater like this that you can use. And the advantage of this is that it holds still pretty well for you as long as you brace it. And so what I do is lean over it like this, and then I take the cheese and grate, and I can do it as quickly as I want to, and there you are. And that's a nice way to grate cheese. This next idea comes close to um, being a bit of a contraption, but it is convenient. You can find this in uh, kitchenware stores, and it looks like a sieve, but it's curved to fit over the top of a pan. And if you have uh, soup and you would like to drain off some of the broth, or if you have cooked a pan of potatoes and you'd like to drain off the potato water to save it for soup stock, and um, leave your potatoes in the pan, maybe you want to serve the potatoes in the pan, you can set this on 
and you can hold the handle at the same time and pour and your potatoes will stay inside and the liquid will drain out. If you like to use a salad spinner after you've washed lettuce for a salad and you want to shake off the water from that lettuce, a really nice way to do it is in a spinner, but not all spinners are the same. If you can find one that works by being pushed from the top, then you can do it very easily with one hand. Like that and it spins the lettuce and after you lift the lid you can pull up your lettuce and set it aside and drain the water from the bowl out. Some of the salad spinners are designed so that you have to place the lid on and hold it with one hand while you pull uh, a little ring with a string out the side so that you can spin the basket inside and obviously that doesn't work well with one hand. Some salad spinners also are to be held up in a sink and they have a hole in the bottom and um, those don't work as well. So if you can find this type, it's a nice kind to have. One thing to remember is that if you have a big, heavy casserole dish, you will not want to pick it up from the end probably. So when you're using a hot pad, you would take it to the middle of the dish like this and um, the fact is that the cheese or whatever's on top is probably going to get um, cloth is probably going to hit the cheese but you can do it like this and even though it's a pretty heavy pot it won't be a problem to lift it if you take it from the center if you have a really enormous dish it's probably because a lot of people are going to be eating and so those people can be the ones to handle the very very big dish But if you're just storing food, um, or if you're putting something in the microwave, one thing to remember is that with all of these casserole dishes that have lids, the lids are usually concave on the top, and when you go to pull it out of the microwave, you've got a little bit of a problem to grasp it from the side, because you can't just lift from both sides like other people might do. And so you might consider when you put it in the microwave to put it with the lid inverted. That might mean the little knob is down in your food. That doesn't hurt at all. And it means that when you go to pull it out from the microwave, you have a much easier time putting your thumb on here and getting a grip on it to slide it along and to grasp it like that. You might find too that when you're storing casserole dishes that have lids, if you can put the lids down like this, they're much easier to pull out, obviously, from the cupboard, from the shelf, and, of course, they're a lot easier to stack. You need to do that.